today's uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Tara Sinus uh, in Google. And Tara uh, is actually uh, the, the achieving a lot of uh, the, the uh, innovations uh, in speech field. And I think everyone knows her kind of a great the achievement, especially the, the, the her kind of a recent work uh, in Google or related to end-to-end -end, uh, speech uh, recognition, uh, making the other uh, field of uh, our community to move to the uh, end-to-end uh, with her uh, great achievement. And today's her talk is about latest advances, uh, including the, uh, the, uh, the low latency, uh, the, uh, the on-device uh, end-to-end, multilingual uh, and so on. I'm really excited to uh, the have our, uh, the, the Tara uh, here. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thanks for having me, Shinji, and everybody at Um uh, It's been really fun talking to all the students so far. Oh, you're muted. All right, it says when I share, then I automatically get muted. <laughs> um, let's see. There are maybe some, yeah. So let me share my entire uh, screen. Let's try that. This may work, yeah. Does that work better? At least the audio is working. Okay, you can, you can, uh, you guys can see the slides? Yes. Okay, so we'll just go this way. Yeah, maybe you can make it uh, the, the hardest day. Uh, entire screen, uh, is it possible to do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually currently window. So. Is that good? Yes, that would be better, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So today I'm going to talk about the latest advances uh, in end-to-end -end speech recognition at Google. And this is very much a joint effort between the Google brain, the hardware, and the speech teams. Uh, and I can't, now that I've gone in full mode, I can't actually see when somebody has a question, but, um, but please feel free to interrupt during the talk uh, and I'll be happy to answer your questions or we can wait till the end, however, you know, whatever is most convenient for all of you. So basically this talk is gonna focus on going through, you know, what is end-to-end -end ASR? What has been the historical development of end-to-end -end ASR? And then what are the major advances that we made uh, at Google all the way up to what was released this week, which I'll show a video on, which was our latest and greatest end, end model on the Pixel 6 phone, which is you know, the best uh, speech recognition system Google has released to date. So let's talk about what is end, -end ASR. <coughs> so this is a system which maps uh, you know, a sequence of acoustic features directly into words. That's what we mean by end to end. Or another way of saying this, a system which is actually trained to optimize the final metric that we actually care about as, as users, which is word error, not a metric that is max, uh, that is you know minimizing some cross entropy loss on phonemes when we when, and then combining with additional systems to get to words. So this is going directly from acoustics all the way to words. So let's take a look more pictorially how this compares to a conventional ASR system. So in a conventional ASR system, we take our input speech, we extract some features, we then go to an acoustic model, which maps features to subword units, typically phonemes. And then a pronunciation model will give a sequence of phonemes that maps to a specific word. The verbalizer will help to convert um, phonemes from the spoken domain to the written domain, which is typically an issue in numerics or URLs. And a language model gives probabilities of words following uh, previous words. So all of these components are trained separately. And you know, oftentimes there's a lot of uh, knowledge that people have in one, and, and a lot of very detailed specific knowledge that, that many research have in specific parts of this, like acoustic modeling or language modeling or pronunciation modeling. So we take all of these components, we put them together maybe with the second pass the score and we all put words. What we're looking to do in end-to-end -end models is say, can we replace this whole 
conventional system with all these different sub modules by just one neural network that goes features all the way to words. And why do we want to do this? Well, one is this is a lot simpler. We don't need all that uh, C specific knowledge of how do we do the mapping from phonemes to words? How should we train the language model? Um, you know, what are the different optimizations of the acoustic model or the different subword units? We can directly go from features to words. It's a lot simpler. We are hoping that, you know, when we started this, that optimization, because we're optimizing everything jointly, potentially the word error will also be better. And this model should be a fraction of the size of the conventional model, which we will show. And that can help us to do on device speech recognition, which has huge implications for um, privacy, for reliability when you're not connected to the internet, for example, and speed as well, speed and latency. So let's look at the historical development of end to end ASR. So perhaps one of the first papers that, that did this was the Connectedness Temporal Classi Classification or CTC by Alex Graves. And this model um, basically went audio to suburb units where a, a, an additional special symbol called blank, which we'll uh, denote by B, was introduced. And CTC maximized the total probability of the label sequence by marginal marginalizing over all possible alignments. So one of the main benefits of CTC is the frame level alignment we often needed with a conventional um, uh, neural network system. We didn't, uh, with the cross entropy system, we did not need with CTC. So one of the first CTC based N10 models was proposed by uh, Navdeep and Alex Graves in uh, 2014, which is a character based CTC model, which went from uh, acoustics all the way to graphemes. There was also a uh, follow up work that looked at incorporating a language model into this because a CTC model alone with graphemes does, as we will show, does very, very poorly unless you incorporate some language model. There was future uh, follow up work that looked on training this on you know, large scale data with multiple languages. And then more recently, around 2017, um, work from IBM and Google looked at using longer level, longer span units, so word level uh, CTC models. And of course, many, many others. In 2015, a few research labs introduced what we'll call the attention based encoder and decoder model. In this model, you first have an encoder, which we think of as analogous to an acoustic model, which takes the input features and transforms them to some higher level, higher level representation. Then you have an attention module, which identifies which frames of the input we should pay attention to, to produce the relevant output. We can think of this attention model as sort of like an alignment model. Then the decoder, which is similar to a pronunciation and language model, is an autoregressive uh, model, which operates by predicting a specific subword unit given the previous subword unit predictions. So my colleague Rohit uh, compared the performance of these different models on a voice search task. And when we say online or offline, online basically means that the model is streaming and offline means that we see full context before we uh, run the decoder. So an intention-based model is always offline. It's, I mean, a, a typical LAS system would be run offline. It's not online. So what you can first notice is that the word array of the CTC graphing model without any LM is far, far worse than conventional or attention-based models. So the attention-based model performs better than the conventional model, but it's still, uh, sorry, better than the graphing model, but it still lags behind you know, uh, the, the conventional model. At, uh, uh, the attention-based model is around 11.7, and you can see conventional is 8.6 offline. So around 2018, we started looking at ways to improve this attention-based model. And we first looked at using multi-head attention. So attention in general examines which part of the input you should pay attention to to predict a current unit. And there was some work from Vision by uh, Ashish Vashwani, which looked at uh, using multiple attention heads. And we applied the same thing in this Q et al. paper in 2018, where instead of having one attention head, we have multiple attention heads. And this allows uh, the model to focus on different parts of the utterance to predict 
each label. And you can see from the plots on the left, the left here is the single attention plot, and the red on the right is the multi-head attention plot. And you can see the multiple attention heads uh, at any point in time. And actually, most of them are looking uh, prominently towards the previous frames. We also wanted to look at units that were longer than graphemes. And why did we want to do this? First, longer units have a lower language model perplexity. And because we have to predict fewer of them compared to graphemes, we can actually run the decoder more efficiently. Word pieces, one of the first places they were looked at was for Japanese by Mike Huster. And Kanishka Rao also looked at them for RNMT with good results. So the current way the word piece model tokenization works is we, we take a bunch of text-only data where we don't see any acoustics, and we train the word piece model to maximize the language model likelihood on this data. The units learned are position dependent, so this under space here means actually space, but you, uh, so under star GO, you associate this with um, the, the start, of, uh, start of the word for good, and they're determined deterministically. So the units also back off the characters, which means we don't have any OOVs. So here's an example of good afternoon and how we've decomposed it into its word piece inventory. And you can see this underscore geo and underscore AFT are the position dependent word piece tokens. Finally, minimum word error training um, was also looked at. So we train end to end models by optimizing a cross entropy criterion, which I've shown here, P of the log likelihood of P of Y given its history and the acoustics X. But this doesn't match the metric that we care about in the end, which is word error rate. So my colleague Rohit looked at changing the optimization of the end to end model so that we actually compute um, an ex you compute a loss that, it's, that is based on the expected number of word errors here. And so what we do in training is we first train with this cross entropy criteria, and then once the model has reached a good state, we switch over to the uh, minimum word error criteria. We also looked at various improvements such as scheduled sampling, that is feeding in the previous prediction from the model rather than its true prediction, because this is sort of mimics how you would run the model in research. And this helps prevent overfitting. Label smoothing, which is you take the probability, you take the class with the highest probability and you remove some weight from it and distribute it to all the remaining classes, again, to help prevent overfitting. And an improved op optimization where we synchronize uh, gradient updates between workers rather than doing it asynchronously. And this leads to better conversions and also better model, model quality. So, in this paper, Chu et al., we compared an attention-based model with all of these improvements I just discussed to a conventional server-based model, which, so you can see that the server-based model is 7.2 gig compared to the attention-based model, which is 0.4 gig. Now, we can see that the attention-based model is smaller in terms of size, about 18 times smaller in the first pass. Um, if you, and it's also, roughly a 16% relative improvement over the conventional model. But the main drawback of this model that we've uh, presented in Chu et al. is that the model is not streaming. The conventional server-based model is streaming, but the attention-based model, we have to see an entire chunk of audio before we start running the decoder to figure out where to pay attention. So with next, transition around 2019 to looking at streaming end-to-end -end models. <clears throat> so what do I mean by streaming? Streaming, re, streaming speech recognition is sort of a key component of the Google speech recognition system. We need to, when we say a search query or a dictation query, we need to be able to recognize the audio as quickly as possible, endpoint, finalize the result, send this up to the server so that it can take action, maybe uh, you know, fe or fetch the search results or, or, or turn on the lights or, or perform some action that we ask it to do. We need this to be done as quickly as possible, otherwise the user experience won't be very good. And this streaming speech recognition, as I said, is really like the bread and butter of almost everything that we do. Everything has to be done in a streaming fashion. 
So recurrent neural network transducer is very similar to CTC in that it predicts, you know, it's, it's streaming and it predicts an extra blank label blank. So it has an encoder network, which is a set of recurrent layers, and it's very similar to an acoustic model. It takes acoustic frames, outputs some higher level representation. Then we have a prediction network, which is very similar to a language model. It takes the previous prediction and then eventually will go through other layers and, and predict the output. The joint network combines the acoustic and language model predictions, and it makes uh, and it predicts the output label tokens after the softmax and an additional token blank just like CTC. This model is jointly optimized end to end, and like CTC, we don't need an alignment. But the biggest advantage of this model compared to listener transpel or neural transducer or Mocha is that this model is streaming. Because latency is such a concern with, uh, with, with most of the uh, products in, in Google, we typically run a voice activity detector. This is an externally trained small neural network that tells us where's the start of speech and where's the end of speech. And when we get to the end of speech, that tells us the user is done speaking and we should go and finalize the result. But we've been talking this whole time about, you know, trying to train everything jointly, the acoustic, the pronunciation language model jointly in one network, but now we have the separate VAD. So we thought, let's actually make the VAD part of the network itself. So what we did is we had the RNMT predict an additional token as it's predicting the labels, which is I'm done with the sentence, end of utterance. And so the model will predict this. And when the when end of sentence is predicted, that means the user is done speaking. We should go fetch the results. When we trained this, we penalized the board backward in training such that the model would learn not to omit too early before the user was done speaking or too late. So if we compare the results, the first line here is the RNMT with the external voice activity detector. And the second one is the RNMT with the end-to-end -end EP that we just proposed. And you can see that this gives much better um, quality and latency trade-off compared to the conventional way of doing it. So finally, one can imagine that when you run a streaming-based system, you will take a quality degradation compared to running something full context like LAS. So we want to be able to incorporate the attention-based model into our production system, um, but we cannot do this in the first pass. So the way we thought of doing this is you first run the first pass RNMT model. So you run the shared encoder and a first pass decoder, which gives you the streaming result right to the screen. Then you cache the encoder outputs for that specific utterance or that specific segment, and you run a second pass attention-based LS decoder that attends to the cached first pass uh, encoder outputs. And in this case, you could either run a second pass beam search with LAS or you could rescore. But because the second pass beam search, because you have to wait till the end of the utterance and then run this, uh, the second pass beam search, it will be too slow. So we chose for latency purposes and user, um, you know, especially user perceived latency purposes to run a rescorer. And you can see that when you run the LAS rescoring on top of this on-device RNMT, we can achieve around 11% improvement in inboard error rate. So if we put all of this together, um, our conventional server-based model with the second pass rescorer is around 87.2 gig. It has a word error of 6.6 .6 on voice search and an endpoint there, this is an EOU latency of 870 milliseconds. The on-device model with the first pass RNMT and second pass LAS rescorer is more than 300 times smaller. It's much better in terms of quality on voice search, 6.1, and it's also better in terms of latency. Uh, and this model was deployed in 2019 for the Pixel 4, on the Pixel 4 phone. And there was a lot of you know, very nice coverage in the press about this. But one of the main, uh, you know, a main, uh, main feedback that we got was basically you can ask your assistant to do things 
that are very local to your phone. And they'll happen super quick and it's a lot faster and needs to rely much, much less on the Google server. So basically this model was sitting on device. Uh, it did not need to be connected to the cloud. And it's you know pretty similar to the model, the quality of the model on the cloud and much, much faster. So here's a demo of the one on the left. This is a Gboard demo. The one on the left is doing the server-side transcription uh, on, on, on server. And the one on the right is the on-device. And you can see how much faster the one is on the right compared to the left. Yeah, start again. Okay, so this, like I said, this model was released for Pixel 4 about two years ago. And since then, our group has tried to see what are the ways that we can make this model better? What are the issues with that, with that Pixel 4 model? And there's two issues that, that arose. So one is the model is trained with about 100 million audio text pairs. That's a fraction of the size of the billion uh, utterance uh, language model data that the conventional model is trained with. And because the conventional model is trained with all of this language model data, what we found is that the end-time model did really, really poorly on long-term named entities. If you gave it some obscure phrase, like uh, even COVID, it would just not get it right. It was spelling, it was, you know, it was spelling it K-O-V-I-D, I think. And the second area we wanted to improve is uh, long form, you know, as we've been working from home, meeting transcription is going to continue to become more and more important. And anytime you go with some sort of attention based model, where you have to wait to, to get, you know, one second or two seconds of audio and then run it. Um, these models are not robust for long form and attention models lose attention in long form too. So we found that when we wanted to transcribe 30 minute long videos, these attention models were, I mean, they were really losing focus. Um, the word errors were in the order of higher than 50%. And secondly, the issue with rescoring is that you're only as good as your first pass. You know, if your first pass doesn't put the word in the beam, then your rescoring is not going to help you. So it's better if we can run a beam search as opposed to rescoring. But beam search with, with attention-based models is difficult because you have to wait to get a big portion of audio before you can run the LAF model. And this is just not robust to long form. So what we looked at in you know, 2020 and 2021 is, uh, is the following. And everything I'm gonna talk about here is actually what we deployed on Pixel 6. And I will show a video of that uh, at the end. So let me first review what our goals were for, for the research and production teams with Pixel 6. So our goal was to develop an on-device model that one is better in quality, both as measured by word error rate, better than a conventional based model on both general search traffic and now long tail phrases. We want this model to be faster in terms of latency, both the endpointer latency and both the on-device computational latency compared to the server-based model. And we want it to be robust to long form, meaning that it consumes much less power than the Pixel 4 or 5 for both short and long form audio. And the ultimate goal of this is we want this model to be running completely 100% on device without being connected to the server in any way other than that you need a, you know, if you're giving source queries, you need some action or response. So let me just review the Pixel 4 or 5 model that I discussed a few slides ago. So that model is an LSTM encoder. It's around 105 million parameter LSTM encoder. It's a, for the first pass is a 20 million parameter LSTM decoder. And then we run on the second pass, this, this uh, attention-based model is a 54 million parameter additional LSTM encoder and a transformer race score. And this model is trained only on 100 million uh, audio text pairs that span domains of search, dictation, Google Home, and telephony and YouTube. So 
So Pixel 6 is a uh, Tensor SoC hardware. It an has an on-device edge TPU on the phone, has eight TPU cores, and the Pixel 6 has eight gigabytes, and the Pixel 12 Pro has 12 gigabytes of DRAM. So there's a lot more cores and a lot more compute power on this uh, on Pixel 6 compared to Pixel 4 or 5. And we want to develop an architecture that can meet all the goals that we specified on the previous slides and really take advantage of this hardware. So what are the ways we're going to do this? We want an encoder where we can basically compute multiple frames at the same time. So we're going to look at replacing this LSTM encoder, which is sequential in nature, with some sort of a conformer or transformer, which we can batch across frames. And we can take advantage of those large cores on the pixel. We want a decoder that's super small that we can actually fit into the SRAM. So we're going to try to take that 33 million parameter LSTM decoder and see if we can just replace it with a simple lookup table. We want to make sure that instead of running this rescoring second pass, which I was describing some of the issues with it with respect to long form and quality, we want to see this and we can replace it with a second pass beam search, which is more robust to long form and should actually give us better quality. And finally, we want to introduce some sort of a language model that's going to help us on long tail named entities. So first, let me go through uh, how we did this latency improvement where we replace the LSTM encoder with performer. So the LSTM, as it's shown in this top figure here, is sequentially time dependent. So in order to compute h of 1, I need to see uh, the the frame x of 1, and I need to see the history from the previous time step. The same thing with h of 2. I need to see audio x of 2 and the history from the previous time step. So this is sequential in nature, and so we cannot parallelly process multiple frames at the same time. And another issue we see with LSTMs is that because of the sequential nature in time, uh, there is anecdotally on very long utterances, we do see deletions in long form because of this, you know, it's a, it's a vanishing gradient problem, basically. Uh, and, and, um, and we see that we will delete audio. Now let's compare this to a conformer or a transformer architecture, as we have on the figure on the bottom right. In that model, multiple activations can be computed in parallel at the same time. So this is much more TPU, TPU friendly. There's no recurrence or sequential dependency in the model. And so deletion becomes less of a concern. So we also want to look at replacing this LSTM decoder. And the reason is on the Pixel 6, there's a, you have to, whenever you do computation, your whole model sitting on CPU, for whatever computation you have to do, you have to transfer those parameters up to the TPU um, and do the computation. And there's a huge latency transfer of parameters between the CPU uh, and the SRAM of the TPU. In fact, if that's the biggest latency. It's not the actual compute of the um, model. It's transferring the model from, from CPU to TPU. So the smaller we can make this decoder, then it can actually fit inside the local SRAM of the TPU. So what we did is we said, can we take this 33 million parameter decoder and just replace it with a simple lookup table, where we take the previous two tokens, we look them up in a lookup table, take their outputs, and pass them to the you know rest of the joint network. And what we found that's described, and we were able to reduce you know basically 33 million parameters down to two million parameters, and that's described in this paper Bodros et al. And we found this gives us roughly 30% computation speed up, and absolutely no accuracy degradation at all. And for a long time, we have thought that the, you know, encoder is doing is the acoustic model and the decoder is the language model. But after we, you know, ran experiments like this, and not just us, if you look at Rami's paper, there's lots of others in, in the field who have done similar things. Uh, that you can make this decoder really small, and in fact, the encoder is indeed is actually learning both acoustic and language model information. Okay, we also looked at a quality improvement, what we call multi-rate encoder. So in the Pixel 5 architecture, 
it was just what we did is we ran the first pass we waited till the end of the utterance or the end of the segment which was at least you know a few seconds long of audio and then we ran this rescorer which we said a is not ideal for long form attention models also lose attention and on long on, on they lose attention on long utterances and typically beam search should be better than rescoring so we introduced this uh model called the multi-rate encoder it was introduced by three different papers at google but we're going to focus on the last one by arun uh and this is called cascade he called it cascade encoder and that's you know what i'll refer to in the subsequent slides in this model you run a causal encoder that feeds to a decoder and then in the second pass you have an additional set of non-causal conformer layers that look just one second to the right so what happens is that you're computing the first pass, and then once you see one second of audio, you start running the non-causal encoders uh, in parallel. And so this allows you to output something quickly to the screen with the first pass, but then the second pass only has to be one second behind. And because we run it faster than real time, um, you know, this is not really perceived to the user. And this gives us a quality improvements because we can run the beam search and run in real time. And two, this is a lot more robust to long form because this is this is a transducer based model. It uh, doesn't have these long form attention based issues. And the other improvement we looked at was to introduce some sort of a neural language model. So we had tried for a long time to train language models on all of our text data and do cell effusion or cold fusion or deep fusion, and we didn't get much improvement. And last year, uh, my colleague Isan Variani introduced this hybrid autoregressive transducer. And what that does is, so that models score coming from end to end is P of Y given X. He subtracts out an internal language model score, which we call P internal language model of Y. So just these first few terms, if we look at them, should give us P of X given Y. Now this becomes a generative model. And that allows us to more mathematically incorporate um, an external language model P of LM, PLM of Y. So we use this factorization and perform and introduce two different language models. One is we take a contextual biasing FSC that is trained on, let's say, it's not trained actually, just it's a FSC with simple scores, but the uh, entities of that are songs, contacts, apps, like geolocations. So it, when, when you, when you go to a specific uh, place like Pittsburgh, you're gonna ask for certain restaurants, or you're gonna ask for the score of the Steelers game, you're not gonna ask for the score of the Red Sox game. So this, so it will prefer to display to the user um, words or phrases based on a steel location. So this is contextual bias. To address this long tail issue, we trained a conformal language model on 100 billion text utterances. And we did rescoring with this. We did not do shell effusion because shell effusion is, is too expensive to do with the N10 models because it's like running a big neural network. This conform LM is around uh, 70 million parameters. It's like running that every step of the beam search. It's very expensive. So we have to run it as a rescore. But we use this to help with that long tail proper noun issue with Delta. So first, let's look at some important test sets uh, that we that we track at Google. So these are first, there's a clean voice search set, a noisy voice search set, a numeric set, and these are you know uh, a planning set and a, an Android set. These are important sets for different uh, Android applications that uh, that people use on the phone. First column is server, uh, this classic base system. Second one is the Pixel 4.5 model from 2019. And this is the Pixel 6 candidate. And you can see significant improvements in every single test set. Um, and this conformer cascade encoder with the neural LM is the best ASR that the speed team has built to date. And that's described in this paper. This was given at Interspeech, this paper. I also mentioned biasing. So biasing is really important because it's an attempt, it's an attempt to adapt your model to priors uh, in the to, to prior information so that you can bridge the gap between training and inference. 
So by incorporating some context, you can allow the model to recognize, you know, restaurants in Philadelphia, not in uh, Pittsburgh, or um, sports teams in Pittsburgh as opposed to somewhere else. The most common use cases are for contacts. So you call certain people on your phone, media, so you play certain songs you want on your phone or, or apps. And on these three test sets, contacts, media, and apps, the first column is server with and without biasing. With biasing is here, without biasing is in parentheses, then pixel four or five, and the conformer. And this trend is the same, that this is the best ASR that the speech team at Google has built to date. Uh, and the biasing quality is, is um, you know, outperforms on Pixel 6, what we previously found on 4, 5, and, and Classic. And finally, we ought to make sure, you know, we're not overfitting to any test set. What we did is we took a bunch of 500 utterances of logs data that's completely unseen. We ran the conventional face model and the N10 model on these. And then we looked at uh, the results. So win means that our Pixel 6 model is outperforming server. Loss means we're losing to server. Neutral means they're about the same. The p-value is how statistically significant is this? And the impact is what is the actual impact of this model based on the amount of traffic you change and, and, um, and the dips. Typically, an impact of one e to the minus two is considered pretty significant. Um, this is 5.7 e to the minus two. So this is a very significant change. I mean, we're, this model is much, much better than, um, because it's 120 wins to 36 losses. So it means this Pixel 6 model is much, much better than the current server-based model. And to drive home this point about long tail named entities, I want to play a video now. So the video on the left will be the Pixel 4 model, and the video on the right will be the Pixel 6 model. Can you guys hear this? Okay, I'll play it again. So you can see the model on the right says, bear, we, uh, so Ryan is saying Bear County, Texas. The model on the left is saying, is spelling it as B-E-A-R, but in fact, Bear County, Texas is spelled B-E-X-A-R. And you can see now with this language model rescorer um, that this Pixel 6 model actually gets it right and is doing much better on long tail. So I want to um, play a video. This video is nine minutes long. I don't know. Let me check what the time is. I'll, I'm not going to play it for nine minutes. I'll probably play it for you know three or four minutes. Um, but this is a lot. So the Pixel 6 was, was released this week. And this is a video of um, you know the speech on, that, uh, on the Pixel 6. And I'll just play it so you can get an idea of, of what we can do. Hi, Tara. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think we couldn't hear your audio from your computer. You um, can't hear it? No, but oh, really? if you stop your share and um, click the reshare button, there would be an option your computer audio. Uh, let's see here. Um, also, before we hear the example, there's a question in the chat from Thomas Schott. Yeah. Got a phone call from uh, Amazon about um, a fraudulent order that was placed on my account. What? Rich? We can hear you, Rich. I think he was saying that uh, Tara's is much better audible when she was leaning to the right. So something improved with the audio quality when she was not. <laughs> it, it was much so, louder, uh, uh, her voice, right? So I think that was what he was referring to. Can, you know, if I play this, can you hear this now or no? No? No. OK, so unfortunately, I cannot share so basically, I cannot download the Zoom app because it's not allowed. Uh, like Google does not allow to download, download Zoom, Zoom, so I'm using, using the web browser. browser. 
um, if, if somebody, somebody has a slide, slide and wants to share the video, the video we, we can play the video, video but I, I, I can't, can't uh, share, share the audio. audio. Um, maybe we could do that. Um, so Brian, could you is there a way that, or, or Shinji, is there a way that you could do that? Or maybe we could go on with the talk a bit, or maybe Thomas could ask his question. Yeah, yeah that, that works. works. I, I, this, this is actually, actually I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the, the last slide, slide so. so. Okay. Yeah, we have plenty of time. Um, but, uh, how about, so how about if Thomas asks his question, and then let's see if who, uh, Alan is also quite good at this kind of thing. Um, uh, who thinks that they can play the video with sound? Um, does it have, um, is it on YouTube? Can I find the video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, on, it's, on, it's, on, it's on YouTube, YouTube actually. If I, I can, can even paste it in, in the browser, browser for somebody if they, somebody want, if they want, want to just, just yeah, yeah, let's um, just do yeah. this. Why don't you do that? By the way, Tara, you, um, we're getting a double echo from you. I presume you changed the audio things and it's now coming out twice. Can I, I didn't change anything. Uh, still twice. You're also blank. <laughs> Is that, that better? better? Yep. No. Oh, wait. Is no, it coming, out, is is it coming, coming out, out twice? twice? Yeah. <laughs> oh, now. Is it coming out once or twice now? Yeah, now you're one voice. <laughs> okay. Except I just echoed. Um, yeah, actually, so Google does not allow us to download Zoom because obviously it's a competitor of Google. And so we have to use the web browser. And therefore, um, yeah, this is the video. Okay, so, so let's see if this works and see if you can hear it. Um, I don't hear it. You cannot hear. So you no. can't hear it? No. no. First, you hear it now? Now I think, yes. Okay. With challenges that are unique to each person. It means understanding syntax, intent, and the context of your request. Knowing the terms and names that are important to you, but potentially uncommon to others. Understanding your accent, dialect. Isolating your voice when there's background noise, and even hearing you correctly if your mouth is full. Google has led the industry for years with our natural language processing. That's why search queries are so accurate, Google Translate is so good. Thanks to some outstanding work from our speech team, Pixel 6 has an on-device speech recognition model that can transcribe speech with incredible accuracy. And thanks to Tensor, it does it using half as much power as previously possible. It's the most advanced speech recognition model ever released by Google. With this new capability, we rethought the voice typing experience based on some key insights about how people write. Let me show you how it works. Hey, Ronnie, are you still up for dinner tomorrow? With our friends? You can see how accurate the transcription of my friend's name is. Pixel is smart enough to take the hint from my contacts list. And the mic stays open while I tap to insert a clarification about who's coming. Pixel even automatically adds the right punctuation, so I don't need to specify where to put commas and question marks. Let's keep going. I hope you can come. Catherine is hosting this week. Of course, Pixel won't always know which Catherine I'm talking about, and the one I have in mind spells her name with a K. The language model also helps with transcription suggestions, so corrections make sense based on what you're saying. Historically, transcription suggestions have been the same ones designed for typing based on keystroke proximity. But that doesn't make any sense if you aren't typing with keystrokes. Now, Pixel's model is phonetically based, meaning it suggests corrections that sound similar. So Catherine with a C becomes Catherine with a K. Instead of catharsis, or cathedral, or whatever else you might have ended up with. And to make voice typing as fast as possible, I should be able to do more with my voice, including commands like clear or send. Pixel is smart enough to understand that I don't want those words in my message. I'm sure it's going to be great. Clear. I'm looking forward to it. Catherine has a really nice new place. Send. See how fast that was? Also notice that your phone remembered it's Catherine with a K, so you won't have to make the same edit twice. The model adapts to your usage. And watch this. The model also unlocks the accuracy of emoji transcriptions 
which is so much faster than searching through little pages of icons. I think we're making homemade pasta emoji and ice cream emoji. Send. With the new speech model, typing with your voice is faster and easier than just typing with your fingers. Thanks to Tensor and these new breakthroughs, we can do all this on device without connecting to a server, so it's super fast and reliable. We really think it's going to change how you use your phone. Google's natural language understanding allows us to rethink phone calls, too. Call screen is great for shielding you from spammers. Unknown callers have to say why they're calling before you decide to pick up or hang up. It's a useful feature, and the tensor speech models are making call screen even more accurate in Pixel 6. The next problem we wanted to solve is calling a business. It's been the same bad experience for decades, with whole music, the same long automated system saying, your call is very important. It's the worst. But Pixel 6 makes it so much better for you. Now, before you even place your call, Pixel shows you the current and projected wait times, so you can call when it works for you. And when you do call and encounter that endless list of options, like press 1 for branch hours and locations, you actually don't need to listen carefully and remember all the automated menu options. Google Assistant listens for the details and shows them on screen for you to tap. Of course, if you still find yourself in the hold queue, don't worry. Google Assistant will hang out on the line and listen to the hold music for you. It understands the difference between a recorded message and an actual representative on the line and lets you know when a real live human is ready to talk. Tensor also dramatically improves translation features in Pixel, so you can interact naturally with people who don't speak the same language that you do. Pixel can help with smart, simple translation that's there wherever you need it. Just like with voice typing, speed and accuracy are best in class. Until now, these kinds of breakthroughs haven't been able to run on a phone. They require intensive computation on highly specialized hardware. This is exactly what Tensor is good at. It improves Pixel's translation quality by 18%, a level of improvement that typically takes multiple years of research from a world-class research team. And the improved model uses less than half the power when running on Tensor. We all have friends or family members whose native language isn't the same as ours, and I've always wished I could speak with them in the language they're most comfortable in. With Pixel 6, I can finally do that. My sister-in-law is Japanese, and here's a message from her. It says, I have a question about the latest Pixel. Now I can reply in English, and it will show up in Japanese for her. Sure, now I can finally tell you about it. It all happens right on the device in the Messages app, so I don't have to deal with cutting and pasting text into Google Translate. In-app translation is also available in WhatsApp, Google Chat, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Line, and a growing list of other chat apps. Now, if we combine our real-time translation models with our speech recognition models, we can translate audio from any source in real time right on the device itself. It opens up a world of content for people. Watch YouTube videos in your own language stream a sports broadcast from another country, watch Instagram live videos from around the world, all translated and captioned in real time for you, right on your Pixel 6. Translation is even integrated into the Pixel camera, so you can read signs, product labels, documents, and even menus in your own language. Across all the speech and translation features in Pixel 6, you can see a few of the ways Tensor unlocks new capabilities. Google's ML research enables things like helpful voice typing, calling assistance, and translation on Pixel. And we've got one last translation feature to show you today. The improved interpreter mode in Pixel 6 is more fluent, faster than ever, and available in 48 languages. Here's my colleague Shanaz with Marie Kondo to try it out. Marie Kondo is famous for changing people's lives through her Con Marie method of organization. She has a television show, has written books, and is a huge star in the United States. Thank you very much for being our first live translate interview. I love seeing what sparks joy in other people's lives. What sparks joy for people? I think that the people who are in the world are in the 
、ときめく人生を送っていただくこと、これが喜びです。完全な感想ですが、あまりにも完璧に翻訳されているので驚いています。What is it like working in a place where people don't speak the language? 確かに、英語を話すということは私にとっては難しいことの一つですが、でもただ、あの違う価値観や違う言葉をいや文化を持つ人たちと交流できることはとても楽しいことです。It was so nice to talk and connect with you in this way. Thank you. 正直なところ、こんなに私の言葉をしっかり翻訳して伝えてくださっていることに本当に驚いています。Thanks, Alan. One just,、uh, the, there are some people are actually asking me that whether this Japanese English translation is good. And actually, this is perfect. Yeah. So, <laughs> good, good to know. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so that's, that's really, really the end of my talk. I mean, there's a summary slide, slide but I, you know,、uh, I'm more, more than, than happy, happy to take questions from people at this point. And so, Tara, you were echoing again. <laughs> <laughs> I said the end of my、uh, talk, and、um, I'm more than happy to take questions. I think Alan has one.、Mm -hmm. Um, a, a great examples.、Uh, um, it's nice to see it, it not only with the fact that you're trying to compress it to get it run on the device itself, it's better too, which wouldn't necessarily be the case. But one thing is at the beginning, you talked about you know,、um, conventional pipeline systems and you move to end to end systems. And now at the end of your talk, You have a pipeline system, or at least you have a multi module system that's trying to address many of the things of the original system you're trying to replace. Do you have any comment about that?、Um, what do you mean by the pipeline system? Do you mean well, the fact that at the end, you've now got you know, language model、um, information, you've got Beam Search. While the whole point about end to end was to try to not have those explicit components. Within、um, your overall model. Yeah, so maybe I can、um, clarify a little bit more. So, in the conventional model, you have like this separate acoustic model which predicts phonemes. Then you have this pronunciation model which maps those phonemes to the,、uh, you know, the actual words. And then you have a language model which、um, gives you probative words given all the other words. The end to end model, if we forget that external language model, Actually, does do audio all the way to words because it's giving you that P of Y given the label history and the audio, and the,、uh, audio features. The reason we have this external language model is because I'm not saying there's not other ways to do it, but today, like we need to somehow incorporate all that text data that has all those rare proper nouns into the model. And how do we do that? We could Synthesize that text data and, and incorporate it in. I mean, Shinji has worked on tons of things with, like,、um, uh, you know, synthesis or injecting like multimodal,、um, you know, parallel data into the model somehow. So these are things that we are trying. But what we found worked best today was to just train an external language model and fuse it in. So that's the only part really of this that's modular. I mean, that, that's that. Whereas everything else, like there's no pronunciation model, there's no phonemes.、Um, we just go straight from audio to text. And we have、yeah. to run a beam search just like we do in 
I mean, even a conventional model is running a beam search, but the beam is small. The beam is only eight here. Whereas if you look at the density of the lattice in a conventional model, we're talking about thousands. Right. Uh, that, that's a good, I mean, the end-to-end -end model can be thought to be a more complex acoustic model, um, which has words as output rather than phones. Um, and then you have a language model afterwards to get the things that you have to get and do personalization to Pittsburgh restaurants, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shinji, go ahead. Sure. Uh, first, thank you, Tara, for a great talk. And uh, especially, I really want to buy the Pixel 6, uh, given that <laughs> I actually have Pixel 5. I recently bought it because it's cheaper now. But <laughs> maybe I should buy the, the latest one as a speech researcher. Um, my question uh, is about the, the internal language model. I mean, this is cool, and it's actually quite theoretical that you know uh, we kind of subtract the, the internal language model uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the the external language model. But then I feel like uh, uh, the, it's mathematically then it's very similar to a uh, CC with language model, right? So do you, for example, revisit it the CC? Uh, because the CTC is also you know the, due to the kind of uh, the, the better encoder. A model and so on. Uh, there, there are a lot, lot of kind of reports that the, the CTC is getting better and better. And then using the CTC plus language model is mathematically actually doing uh, similar to what you are doing for the uh, subtracting the internal language model, right? Do you have some comment about that? So, but CTC is not, uh, um, so the N10 model is still giving you P of Y given its history, which CTC is not because it's basically, uh, uh, just a frame it's frame independent mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and so that's the big difference with c between this and ctc i see frame independent so all, process all we, yeah i see all we do when we subtract out the language model the the score that comes out when you subtract out the language model is basically ctc because you feed uh zero from the Sorry, it's not basically CTC. You feed zero from the acoustic feature to the encoder, mm -hmm. and then you're basically model modeling P of Y given its history. Mm -hmm. That's the internal language model score. It's just you ignore the acoustics and feed P of Y. But mm -hmm. even with the internal language model, you still have a dependency on the previous labels, whereas CTC ignores that. Got it. I see. I see. Okay. The, one more question. Again, the, I'm actually, you know, uh, the the. Actually, I'm recently revisiting the CTC a lot. And, uh, you know, people in Facebook uh, with the cell supervised learning, they actually, you know, just use CTC is good enough uh, that in some of their experiments, right? But, but anyway, you know, CTC, but the, the, you have some comments on cell supervised learning in this kind of our, uh, their own device uh, perspective. Um, so right now, whatever we presented to you is not doing any super cell supervised learning. But I think mm -hmm. this is going to be a very important area in speech going forward, simply because, like, if I look at what we want to do with these sorts of models going forward, it's to go to new languages, new domains where we don't have all the transcribed data that we have in US English. Right. Like, uh, one of my colleagues, Bo, is working on building, you know, we call it massively multilingual, one, yep. one model for all 80 languages. How can we do code switching with that? And if we don't have the data for that, or if we even think about doing low resource uh, ASR, self-supervised, semi-supervised techniques are going to become really important. And um, we're definitely like, keep, you know, looking at them as we speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, go ahead. Hey, Tara, thank you. That was really, really interesting. So you said you're using a really tight beam for, for decoding. Um, so word array is, is one criteria for, for applications, right? It, this should be really low, but uh, it does not always work perfectly. So um, <laughs> that's where confidence values come in. And I think end-to-end -end models, they have suffered uh, from, from not being really good at providing confidence on a word level. Do you observe similar problems or have you solved that problem? So there was a paper, I don't think I've linked it in here, but um, there was a paper that 
we had at Interspeech on end-to-end um, -end confidence. And basically what we do is we run, we compute confidence at the word piece level. But what we do is we attend to, it's like a deliberation model. So you attend to the first pass hypothesis and the acoustics, and then you compute a, a confidence based on that. And we use that to decide actually if we should run the second pass or not. Um, and that okay. seems to work better than our previous um, uh, confidence-based techniques. I'll find it for you and paste it in the chat. Mm -hmm. the chat. Yeah, that would be nice. But uh, so that, that since you're using this to make a decision for the second pass, so the output of the second pass then I guess has a higher confidence, or do you, do you can you still provide confidence oh, value so, on that? So we haven't looked at confidence after the second pass. What we do is we run the first pass. And if we're confident enough in the first pass, we don't run the second pass. I see, um, I see. And for the most part, there's not a big degradation in quality when we do this. I think it's like 0.1. Mm. And I, I have a slightly different question that is unrelated to this, but you mentioned that uh, there was a distinction between short form and long form. So how long or when does long form recognition start uh, so that transformers are actually having troubles? <laughs> I, I tried played a little bit with uh, uh, with it, and it seems to be relatively short. Um. <laughs> I'll tell you where the transformer has trouble today. Um, we can easily take this model and we can decode thirty minute long uh, YouTube videos. I, 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 um, it, it works okay. I mean, you saw it was okay it was when uh, Alan was playing the video. It was transcribing, right? Mm -hmm. These models break. I still find today when you give it. Uh, when it's uh, faced with some sort of audio, which it's never seen in training. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, let's say you are going to do code switching. You're, you're on the in ES, in US recognizer, you're going to code switch between English and Hindi. It's not mm -hmm. seen Hindi in its training data. Then what happens is that it starts to emit blank because it's a, an acoustic condition that's not seen. Or sometimes if you have overlapping speakers that are speaking, this is not how our training data looks. And so then it gets confused and it starts emitting blank. That's the issue I see. It is indeed able to transcribe. If the acoustic conditions are somewhat similar to training today, it is able to transcribe 30 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. So did, this would mean you don't use any segmentation on, on YouTube? We do segment YouTube, but the segmentation is for a different reason. The segmentation is to know when to run the second pass so we can finalize okay. the result and admit it to the screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I found the confidence model. Let me just yeah. paste the paper in for you. Thank you, Tara. Yep. Thanks. Do we need more, um, more questions from the students? I can tell you I'm just um, ready to buy a Pixel 6 and also ready to use an end-to-end -end model for everything that I do. Uh, and um, um, especially um, I, my husband has a disability I'm a, and in uh, visual and motor disability. And I'm texting him now that he needs to get a Pixel 6 so that he can text. <laughs> so um, anyone else have a question? Um, if not, we can end now. And for the people who are on campus, we will have snacks still outside, even though it's a little cold and rainy. Um, but you can come by for a snack. Um, okay, Tara, thank you so much. Um, it was very clear and informative and, um, you know, both technically and commercially. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, uh, like I said, I'm inspired to try and to end for everything now. Um, uh, okay, thank you so much for talking to us. Cool, thank you for having me. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.